So we'll move on to our uh, final speaker of the day. Um, we're pleased to have uh, Mansu Dale from uh, MIT speaking. Um, and he's gonna talk about, again, his DTI funded project that is looking at uh, COVID intervention policies and tools for health economics and inequality. Thank you. Great. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have the last words. So I'm gonna make it brief so that uh, everybody can do what they wanted to do. So I, I wanted to make some remarks about uh, the impacts of COVID-19 interventions, um, particularly about uh, economics, um, uh, health economics and inequality. Um, this is work that I'm doing with uh, uh, two of my students, Flora Ming and Dalton Jones, and in collaboration with Roberto Regaborn uh, at MIT. So, Part of this motivation that we had is the ongoing conversation. And actually the last uh, three talks have been extremely relevant to the conversation I'm having today, particularly the one on eviction. Uh, we've been hearing quite a bit about the issue of vulnerable communities and how they actually suffered the most from the COVID-19 um, infection, but also from an economic perspective. And so we wanted to understand <clears throat> the trade-offs in that community, which then uh, led us to try to understand what are the determinants for these kind of communities. And I think uh, Karen's talk is actually a really nice uh, sort of uh, segue, you know, sort, sort of a kind of a start, starting point for the material that I'm going to describe. Um, so focusing on just the deaths from COVID-19 as a data set, and we in particular looked at uh, the New York State, uh, we built uh, a decision tree based on a lot of the public data, I would say census data, that is uh, connected to uh, a zip code, uh, looking at demographics and uh, various aspects of the data that is available. We built a decision tree um, to try to come up with the determinants for what is the sort of propensity for higher death from COVID. And this is sort of a bar graph that shows kind of the impact that uh, many of these parameters had. So, you know, income, obviously, as we are hearing from everybody, comes out to be a very uh, strong um, classifier or determinant. Uh, age, in particular, over 65, actually has a, a big, uh, uh, is a big parameter in, in this analysis. Um, um, Race, in particular, non-white, actually played an important role. And overcrowding is also a critical parameter, particularly when it's coupled with the, with the income. And then there are other issues, uh, healthcare and so forth, that, that actually played an important role. But these four parameters seem to have the largest uh, um, kind of uh, discriminating uh, power. So looking at a truncated decision tree, and I'm going to take you a little bit to the more detailed decision tree. But if you're looking at this truncated decision tree, you just get an intuition of what's going on. And this is, again, based on counties in the New York state. I'm going to move on to more general counties in the United States a little bit later. So the first, class, the first feature that we um, um, classify around is the income. So if the income is less than 122,000 a year versus larger, so that seemed to discriminate really well. And then the next feature is the age. If you're above 65, then already you have a cluster, a seg segment of people that are highly impacted by COVID-19 in terms of the probability of death. So low income, old age is a problem right away in terms of the classifier. But if you are younger than 65 or you have a larger percentage of younger people, here it says that you have more than 17, 18% people over 65, but suppose you have less than 17 or 18% um, 65, then you may want to classify further. And so this is actually shown in this more elaborate tree, which I'm not going to bore you with. But essentially what it says is that you can classify around non-whites and then overcrowding, and you get a fairly good uh, cluster of people that are most impacted by COVID-19 deaths. This is to be contrasted to the best segment that has not been impacted by a lot of people. And it looks like these two segments over here, but the one on the right is certainly more affluent people with this inter interesting case also overcrowded, uh, living in the sort of more vibrant part of New York City. Uh, it seems that this particular segment has seen the least amount of percentages of death due to COVID-19. So those are just entirely determinants driven by public data, census data that is tied to um, uh, zip code. So 
So why is that interesting for us? Well, we wanted to understand the relationship between the death by COVID-19 and the economic impacts that have actually resulted in uh, despair for these communities. So let me kind of segue a little bit and talk about unemployment and then put these two things together. So we know, for example, that um, the employment rates have actually gone up um, uh, since COVID-19. And this is a picture on the left here that shows the un unemployment rate of 2019 versus 2020 uh, in all the 50 states of the United States. And you can see that, well, in some states have done better, but by and large, you have a linear regression over here that fits what's, go what's going on. So there's an offset, an increase of about 3%, 3.5%, and a linear uh, regression that shows an increase in the uh, unemployment as, as a function of the unemployment of 2019. So a fairly strong um, uh, kind of statement that unemployment has affected every state in the United States. When we look at the specific um, uh, different counties within New York State, we get something similar, a little bit different in terms of the slope, but the offset is higher. But we are seeing almost all the counties in New York State have been affected by COVID-19. So unemployment has been, in some ways, um, spread out. Um, uh, uh, all over the United States. And if you could just sort of kind of recall from Karen, Karen's uh, talk, I think that this, and I will show you a little bit, we had kind of a course data on eviction, but essentially what happens is that the extended unemployment has this um, individual mortality hazard that increases the probability of death uh, for various reasons. This could be depression, it could be suicide, it could be um, uh, kind of cascaded effects from evictions and what have you. The paper from uh, 2014 suggests a percentage of roughly 73% increase in the probability of death um, due to lo uh, long um, unemployment. So what we are interested in is trying to understand the economic despair projected deaths and see how that affected the communities that we were looking at. In particular, we're interested in that community, in, in those clusters that have been affected most by COVID, death, uh, COVID deaths because of the virus itself, not because of unemployment. So we're trying to understand the relationship between what happened because of the virus, what happens because of the employment, and put that together. Okay, so just kind of giving you a little bit of stats in order to understand actually the perspective of what's happening. Um, so the worst segment, remember, is the one characterized by low income, older, overcrowded, and non-whites. And the better se segments are the one to the right that's essentially the affluent uh, cluster. And if you think about these two clusters and just look at the statistics of unemployment and eviction in there, you see a staggering difference, right? So you look at the increase in unemployment for the worst segment, the one that I described first, uh, 2019 was on average 3.8%, that increased to 5.65%. So substantial increase in unemployment in that particular segment compared to the better segment that is less than half a percent increase in unemployment. So unemployment, while in fact actually was following that kind of bizarre regression, it was very different in different communities. And we could actually find what is where unemployment where the, was the worst, but I'm trying to see what happened to the unemployment in the category in among the people that have been uh, affected most by COVID-19 infections, right? And we see that that number is fairly high. We also see that the eviction rate is substantially higher. Okay, so that, that is a consequence of people living with uh, larger crowded communities and not being able to support a larger community and ending up on the street or moving out of their homes into other people's homes. Okay, so, those things kind of uh, led us to, the, and, and we have a lot more data that we, you know, there's not much time to describe, but led us to try to understand what was the intervention or the policy taken by different states? What was the effect of that policy on these kinds of communities? And what were the different trade-offs? So I'm gonna show you two graphs, spend some time on them, and then kind of come up with a conclusion on this. So the first graph on the le left, uh, and this is done on um, uh, general counties, zip codes, I would say, uh, all over the United States. We classified those in terms of uh, income, and we took the top 40 performing income class uh, uh, categories, and that defined our rich class, and we took the bottom 40 
counties in the United States and those define our poor class in terms of in terms of income. So here's an interesting curve that you see on the left. This is all about the rich people. Orange is about COVID-19 deaths. Uh, so a point on this uh, curve, so for example, this particular point reads as follows. It has 25% stay home, and it resulted in about 100 per 100,000 deaths due to COVID-19, okay? And you can easily see, uh, so we found different counties with different stay, ho stay home percentages. We plotted this curve. I mean, you know, in, in, and when we didn't have it, we extrapolated. But in any case, when you look at this curve, it's fairly interesting that you see a systematic drop in the deaths per 100,000 people as the percentage of people staying home increases. So this was consistent with the lockdown policy as people stay home, less transmission of the disease, less people getting infected, less people dying. That works really well. The blue curve indicates projected deaths by unemployment. So a, a dot in here reads, uh, for example, this one reads 25% of the people are staying home. This is less than 25 per 100,000 projected deaths from unemployment. So what is the projected death from unemployment? We look at the increase in unemployment in that particular, in that particular uh, county. We count the number of people in there. We increase the probability of death based on the analysis of the 2014 paper, and we present that number in terms of the increased number of deaths. So these are despair deaths, and their projected number is not actual deaths. You can you could make this thing in terms of dollar value inter, in, instead of people. But what is interesting also in that among the affluent community, this particular blue curve is also, also dropping as a function of the lockdown. So that also worked very well, indicating that of course the lockdown or people staying home, they were still able to continue because they're at home, that doesn't mean that that's a proxy for losing their jobs. Actually, they're continuing to have their unemployment, they, they, to continue to be employed. And because of that, these two curves are both doing better. They're improving, so the lockdown policy worked for that particular segment of people. Let's contrast that to the situation when we're looking at the poor on the right-hand side, and that's an interesting one. So the red curve, again, is COVID-19 deaths, Blue curve is the projected deaths based on unemployment. So the red curve does the same. COVID-19 deaths reduced by having a higher number of stay home um, because the contagion is less, less people getting sick, less people dying. However, what is interesting is the blue curve that is completely going in the opposite direction. So if you look at the data point over here, it's the, stay, it's the percentage of people staying home versus the projected deaths, you see that that is on a rise. There are lots of outliers for this curve, but on first order, that is actually a fairly good approximation. So you're seeing the exact opposite trend. As people are staying home, the projected deaths based on disparity because of the unemployment is actually a monotone, monotone, monotonically increasing curve. That is the problem with the trade-off. That is the trade-off that did not exist for the affluent community that exists for this particular vulnerable community. And it gave rise to a curve that looks like this. We refer to it as the U curve. We wanted to, I mean, intuitively, that is what people, and we all have been talking about, that this community have kind of lost at both ends of the spectrum. If you allow the lockdown, if you don't allow the lockdown, people were dying from COVID-19. And when you allow the lockdown, people essentially are dying from unemployment. So the policy didn't help them in either side of the spectrum. And that was really the problem with this economic health trade-off. There was really no good trade-off for this particular community. So in order to um, analyze the situation further, I mean, we did what everybody has done. Of course, you know, our analysis was sort of a combination of uh, building a, a, an Asian-based model versus also doing, doing some theoretical analysis. There's not enough time to describe a lot of that, and that also involved a larger group of people doing these analyses. But in principle, we let me just tell you a little bit about the agent-based model, and you've heard enough about it, so I won't describe it in detail. It's a typical SIR model. With the, with the difference is that it's networked. So it's a network model. It allows separate communities to be created within that model. So we have that, we can create multiple communities. 
and we superimposed on that model an economic model. So the shaded area over here describes in a very, very coarse way how economics is affected by the state of infection. So people, when they stay home, potentially it can reduce their output depending on what segment they belong to. So for example, if you're poor, staying home essentially says that your output is less. If you're rich, it doesn't. So it's a function of the uh, class you're in. When you're, when you're ill, of course, you, your productivity is down. You may be temporarily inactive, maybe permanently inactive when you're dead, right? And so we built this economic model on top of that. And we wanted to look at exactly the parameters that we found in the data. The parameters, the most prominent data, that, uh, parameters that we found in the data were income, percentage population greater than 65, percent of non-white population, and overcrowding. Focusing just on income and overcrowding, we looked at the analysis of the agent-based model to try to understand how intervention can be done. So poor will re be represented by low output and overcrowded, rich will be high output and less overcrowded. And of course, we have all the other nuances of the agent-based model that you heard about, the, the, the age dependence, the uh, asymptomatic versus asymptomatic, the relationship between a household versus connectivity outside and what have you. And here's the first thing that we found from the agent-based model, exactly the U curve that we predicted, that we've seen in the data. It's predicted exactly by, um, by the agent-based model. So the green, all solid is for poor, all dotted is for rich. The green curve over here shows, for example, the death as, so we're trying to analyze the lockdown policy, which we can represent by interaction between different agents. And so we show over here, for example, how the increase in lockdown decreases this is the green curve, decreases the deaths uh, due to COVID, but the blue curve shows that they increase due to the disparity, okay, uh, to, due to despair. So despair increases, and so the, the model predicts exactly that, and it shows, for example, that the rich class is not affected by this particular dichotomy. This problem doesn't exist for the rich class. The dotted lines are essentially decreasing. So that gives, um, rise to one thing, which is an important aspect that was mentioned earlier, um, and that is the subsidy. How do you actually prevent the, despair, uh, the, the death by despair or by the mortality hazard? And the point is that the infusion of subsidy needs to be targeted and it needs to be consistent. That is guaranteed income for a certain period of time. And if you actually model that in terms of the Asian-based modeling, you can see nicely that in fact all of a sudden the blue curve is no longer a factor, that there is no increase because as this community is receiving um, sufficient funds guaranteeing them to stay home and to support their family in the duration where they cannot go and work, that actually that disparity, uh, that despair measure disappears and now we just have to deal with the problem of, of COVID uh, infection, but COVID infection is dealt with roughly speaking by by um, uh, lockdown, so we we actually it works out really well. So the first aspect of of um, uh, intervention is targeted subsidy and guaranteed income, which I think is a really important component that many foundations right now are working with poor communities to try to support. The second one is uh, testing. Of course, you know uh, we've done a lot of work on testing. Uh, initially, I was planning to talk about that. Um, and related to some of the talks that were given earlier, there is a very nice tool that, that was produced by our team called wenttotest.org. Um, you can click on it. It's a free tool developed by us, NIH, and, uh, and Radix. And, uh, and this particular tool actually allows evaluation of uh, schools or uh, factories and uh, homes. You look at the architecture of the place, you look at the dimensions, you look at how many people are going to be in a certain location, some of the social behavior in terms of wearing masks, and it's, it's, it spits out how much testing is necessary for you to contain the growth of the virus. So um, it's a very much an interactive tool that allows you to assess how much you need to do testing, and of course, what's the economics that is associated with it. And in particular here, we analyze the impact of testing to the vulnerable communities as we described, and testing clearly is, an, is a very important component. You can test more among um, the segment or the cluster that I described, the one that is mostly affected by COVID-19, and you can actually win on both ends. You can win at the green line, which is the 
COVID deaths, and you can also win on the blue line, which is their ability to work outside. So com combination of testing, combination of subsidy is, is uh, sort of in a targeted way. And the targeted means that you have to identify the groups that you need to target. Uh, so it cannot be a uniform sub subsidy, but rather a targeted subsidy would be critical to achieve this objective. So I, I know I'm running out of time here. So just the implication is that uh, broad interventions have actually disadvantaged certain communities. And, and it's difficult and what's important about trying to understand who these people are, you need, you need signatures, a metric, a, a score that tells you this person, this neighborhood is the one that needs different kind of attention than you know, everybody else that actually is surviving under the lockdown policy. So part of the work is trying to identify these signatures. Our conclusion is that we, you know, moderate lockdown with sufficient subsidies and uh, and adequate testing clearly is a kind of a logical thing to do. But the uh, agent-based model can actually give you specific parameters to worry about. Overcrowding is another area that we think is really critical and important. Uh, we have another analysis of that that we, I haven't talked about. But there have been communities where they've been thinking about how to deal with overcrowding by not mixing different age groups, you know, so not allowing people that are going out to come home to older people, so not, not mixing multi-generations in homes, complicated problem to actually intervene in redistributing people, but there's been a lot of work and thought about this particular problem. And while, in fact, I think we focused on uh, USA data, I think we, th we believe the analysis would probably end up being the same in a lot of different uh, locations. So with that, I end my talk and I'll stop my uh, sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Manzer. Thank you. Great talk. Um, Manzer, that was a great talk. Uh, Shankar here. Hey, you. Uh, uh, you know, I think that your last slide, uh, in, in fact, even during your other slides, I was thinking, you, you know, one of the speakers yesterday was, uh, sorry, was uh, Stefano Bertozzi, you know, who is a public health dean here. He is actually working with somebody you may know called Ziad Obermeyer. Yeah, I know Ziad. Yeah, so they actually made a plea for people like you to work with them on the Mexico data that they have, oh, okay. which actually had quite fine-grained data, in, even about that overcrowding. And uh, they talked about sort of generations of people sharing homes and so on and so forth. So I will make this a mental note to connect you with oh, Ziad, you know, but- I'll uh, email okay. Yeah, yeah. Because I think they're really looking for the kind of analysis you're doing to be applied to that and they have a partnership with the health uh, departments in Mexico, and they, the, who were also on the presentation yesterday. The great, uh, great, great presentation. Thank Thanks, you. Shankar. Thanks, Shankar. It's good to see you too. Likewise. Great. I think Srikanth is up next. He's, it looks like he's itching to go over there. He's going to tell you about the connections of the Illinois talk, which are also actually, actually, nice was, talk. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. I, I, yeah, I was just going to say, actually, also the Stefano Bertazzi's talk. So. Yeah, so there were a couple of talks yesterday where where people had extensive data. I don't know if, if I was part of that, but I missed the Stefano's talk. I was. Yeah, yeah. We'll yeah. introduce you. I think they they're really they'd be way they'd be very glad. I think. Right. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Shankar has said most of what I wanted to say. Well, nice talk. Very nice talk. Thank you, Shankar. Yeah. Hey, nice on one. this uh, that the top slide before the end. Have you followed this uh, sort of Regensburg study about the efficacy, you know, compliance with masks and, uh, you know, they were trying to establish what percentage of compliance is needed to make a difference. And uh, I think, uh, and, and Nigel, uh, the person heading the effort sort of talked about this, the 78% is what they claimed is compliance with uh, is what they needed to make a public uh, impact help. And, I wonder what, what, whether you had such. Uh, I haven't. I haven't followed that uh, in detail. But we, you know, if you click on that uh, uh, wintertest.com uh, dot, dot org, it really is an interesting tool because we've actually used it at MIT to decide what our testing strategy. You know, and what is interesting about it is that you could. It, it's a different thing when you have a large hallway with high ceilings and a small mm -hmm. place with, uh, with which is yeah. more compact, right? And so. Yeah. And so you get a sense of, for example, when you need to force six feet, you know, a six feet separation with masks and maybe frequent testing and when you don't need it. So we get the trade-offs. So we actually specified 
that well, initially we specified a trade-off for every dorm. And then MIT took the worst case scenario and applied it to everybody. You know? <laughs> sounds familiar. It sounds yeah, familiar. And, and so we ended up, we ended up <laughs> testing uh, twice a week for the students and once a week for any faculty staff that wanted to go to campus. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, we, we, we do about uh, 7,000 tests a week, you know? And, um, you know, the percentage of people that got sick is really, really small. So the, the, the method, this stuff, this kind of stuff works. You know, it's, uh, but it's expensive. And so the whole idea of the two, this target gauge, so, you know, we have different schools as pilots that are trying it in the Boston area. Um, but I haven't followed the actual uh, compliance with the mask. It's really interesting. I mean, you know, I objected in Cambridge when they came up with the idea that you have to wear the mask all the time. Um, because personally speaking, I have not seen any evidence of contagion outside when you're walking. Um, you know, um, there's, I've not seen any data of contagion outside when you're walking, but the answer you get all the time is that it's just easier to do it that way. It's a lot easier to say, uh, require the mask all the time. Uh, and and uh, to your point, I think one thing that Nigel said yesterday, which I must say I'm also hearing increasingly, is sort of this, uh, because the, a lot of the transmission is through the aerosolization, sort of HVACs in buildings and sort of fixing the, and it was, it came home to me because, you know, I'd signed up to offer labs, uh, in-person labs at one third the capacity. Anyhow, that's all out the window. But even if it happened, the public health guys shut down my lab, they shut down the instructional lab for mm -hmm. poor uh, HVAC because uh, of studies of the flow, you know, the fluid, yep. the air flow and re yep. recirculation. And, and, and I think Nigel really said, we need to take a look in reopening at that, uh, you know, at the, sort of the HVAC. Uh, so anyhow, that was also- I mean, That's a great question, Shankar. We have actually uh, just got- a, 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 a rapid proposal funded by NSF to look into how to use the HVACs to control the, the vortices so that yeah. you don't actually spread. So you can actually contain, you contain the flow within yeah. a certain neighborhood and not allow it to flow. It's a Fantastic. very interesting, very interesting yeah. problem. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I think that we all need to do our HVACs, right? You know, it's really a, it's a big deal. I really, I'm, I'm It's a great problem. Yeah, yeah. Great. Anyhow, okay, I'll shut up. So I think we should, are we at the end of the, this is the last and best, our, <laughs> last and one of the best. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> there were a lot of great talks.